Hello everybody, this is Luis Angel Carro Perez from Apisaco Tlaxcala and you're watching Teacher Learning Cast with Piri Herrera and Benjamin Stewart. Yeah! Hello everyone and welcome to Teacher Learning Cast episode number 15 this day, June 15, 2018. My name is Benjamin Stewart calling from beautiful Aguascalientes, Mexico. Hello everybody, this is Speedy Herrera again joining you on a Friday because we have a special day today and also from Aguascalientes, Mexico, hoping you all are enjoying the weekend, the, uh, the football matches and everything that comes across you absolutely things have been really crazy uh, the uh this this week trying to finish up with classes but we've got some really special guests uh this week and uh, really happy to have them with us before we begin though i'd like to invite everyone if you are listening and watching this recording or watching us live give us some feedback let us know what your thoughts are about uh regarding any of the topics that we discuss uh we're always looking for uh teachers educators administrators interested in education to share their line their their share their experiences to feel free to join us in these live broadcasts we break broadcast every week and uh, we're really happy this week to have some guests to talk about uh, teacher development uh, specifically here in Aguas Cayentes we have really a great um, opportunity to find out what it takes really to put on a successful uh, teacher conference here locally and uh, the second segment, we're going to talk about some research uh, being done uh, regarding motivation, how to motivate students, and uh, really look forward to uh, talking with uh, all of our guests today. But if you want to participate, feel free to contact us on Facebook, and if you search Teacher Learning Cast, you'll find our uh, public page there where you can share information. You can also reach out uh, to me directly in my website, benjaminlstewart.wordpress.com or PD's website at homers2000.wixsite.com forward slash PDHA. Yes, I'm really glad that we changed once in a while from the routine of doing the transmission on Saturday. And, and um, it's very exciting to have always to have guests here with us at the show. And this time, uh, continuing with some of the ideas we have, ha we have shared before in which we always end up talking about the sharing, the sharing, the, the, the having contact, making connection with the students, in this case, making connections with other teachers. And I think uh, this is a good opportunity to reinforce that thought, sharing and connecting. Absolutely. Sharing and connecting, I think, was kind of a tie uh, that really links all of our past videos. Uh, we've talked in the past, I think last week we focused on output driven hypothesis where we looked at different types of hypothesis of learning we've talked about performance tasks we've discussed uh, pre-service english language teacher experiences as they get into their first uh, semester of uh, simulated classes uh, teacher aids we have a lot of content available so feel free to contact us and uh, reach out and find those videos and uh, this video as well it will be adding to our uh, to our uh, archive and uh, for to so that other one other people can uh, benefit as well. So I'd like to go ahead and get started. And uh, if we could, I would like if we uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Maybe we can start with uh, Salvador and maybe tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and what what you do. Okay, Benjamin. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, well, my name is Salvador Barrientos. I am the general coordinator here at Universidad Panamericana for the language department. What do I do? All kinds of things. <laughs> Administrative, academic, events, whatever it comes to mind, we can do it. So basically, that's the idea. We do what it takes here in the language department. Hi, my name is Carla Salazar. I am an English teacher here at Universidad Panamericana and focusing mainly on advanced English and TOEFL preparation. My name is Ruth Juarez. I'm a full-time teacher here, and I teach at different levels. 
lately basic and intermediate levels. Hello everyone, my name is Mario and I've been working for this university for about 10 years, or so a little more than that. And uh, I teach English as well as Spanish for foreigners. Nice meeting you all. Thanks for inviting us. And uh, my name is uh, Peter Riley. And I also am a full-time teacher at, uh, a part-time teacher at the Universidad Panamericana, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Great, thank you everyone for those introductions. So let's, uh, let's get into uh, the teacher conference. You know, I, I've had, I had the pleasure of attending this last conference back in, in May, uh, the teacher conference at Universidad Panamericana. And uh, I, you know, I remember attending some years ago and was very happy to hear that uh, you were offering it again. Uh, can you talk a little bit uh, about what the conference is about, maybe uh, how it began you know, so many years ago, and uh, anything else you'd like to share about uh, what, the, uh, what the objectives of the teacher conference are? Sure, Benjamin. Look, the conference dates back to 2003, its name it used to be Universidad Bonaterra Teachers Conferences Conference because in those days we used to be Universidad Bonaterra. Then later around 2009, we changed to Universidad Panamericana and the name of the conference changed as well to UPTC. Uh, as UPTC, we had several, uh, uh, several events like back in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, then we jumped to 2014, and 2014 was the last event we had. Then we went all the back to 2018. The idea was that when we prepared the conference, the objective was to gather teachers for teacher development and for teacher sharing. So we found out that uh, talks and conferences were important. However, we found that sharing, networking among teachers were, was just as important as the conference themselves. So uh, we stopped, uh, we took a time between 2012, 2014 and 2018 to have the conference again, because we were having a little response on the side of, of teachers. So we had conferences with, uh, low, with only a few people coming. So we said we weren't sure if we were to continue having these conferences. However, it turned out that this year we had uh, a turnout about 170 people. We can we could hardly fit in the in the conference room. That was fantastic, but it was a challenge to attending so many people. Uh, as uh, another special issue on this conference was that for the first time we had students students studying their bachelor's in language teaching. We had students from Universidad de Otoño. We had students from Normal Superior de Aguascalientes, and I think this was pretty enriching for teachers as well as for the students them, themselves, because they managed to, to talk with experienced teachers from different institutions in Aguascalientes. Uh, Salvador, I, I guess you've been there since the very beginning of this mm -hmm. uh, event. And, and now that you're talking about the involvement of other universities and, and, and the background of it, uh, was the thought in in the first moment when you when you first planned the event for the first time were you thinking about covering more people outside your own university yes since the event started back in 2003 the idea was and we, we did in fact invite people from other universities other high schools and we have had people even from universities outside the state from Monterrey, Mexico City, Guadalajara. So yes, but the idea was to open this, to give it an open uh, figure all the way from the beginning. So, so if I understand you right, it was different this last year where you actually went out and found um, teachers. And I think you also had students, right? I think you had actually uh, students that were preparing to be teachers, is that right? That is correct. We had uh, around 80 students preparing to be teachers from Normal Superior and Universidad del Retoño. Yeah, one thing that I really was surprised and glad to see is I think in uh, Peter's plenary, uh, he started the event with a great talk, really energetic, and got everybody really going. 
but it was interesting to see from all the different schools that were being represented there. It was really, and not just in-service teachers, but pre-service teachers. And, you know, I thought, wow, that was, that's something that you don't always see. You might see, you know, maybe one school or a few schools represented, but uh, it was really good to see that, um, you know, that many schools represented. So that was by design, right? That was uh, something that you, is that something that you're planning on doing in the future? In fact, it is. I don't know if here Mario would like to interact a little bit on how we visited each school. We went personally to some schools and invited them, and the result was fantastic. We usually did this before, however, the result was different this time. We, um, we gladly uh, got results from these different coordinators. That was one of the good points we did that we, uh, we went to the places uh, personally talk to the coordinators, remind them how it was before, uh, remind them because some of them had been here in previous events of our conferences. And, and in this case, we wanted to refresh and to reinforce what, you, what we had before. And we, we had a good, very good result and pretty good response from these uh, coordinators. Uh, they decided to spread the you know to spread the voice uh, if i can say it that way and to talk it over with the teachers and we know uh, that the universities the administration of each, of each one of the universities sponsor the the teachers which is a, a pretty good thing that the universities are thinking that this is a good conference they knew somehow they heard somehow before about our congress before our conferences before so we were pretty glad that we had this response and even sponsor from administration from each one of the institutions. Yes, I think uh, the UPTC 2018 comes into a very important moment here in Aguascalientes. Lately, little by little, we've been looking at universities trying to do different kind of events but lately, in the last year, let's say, it's when we've seen the, uh, this sharing and this exchange, interinstitutional exchange from students from one university going to another, some teachers also going from one university or, or, or one institution to another to share. And I think uh, this UPTC 2008 came into a very, very special moment. And, uh, and the comment is just to ask Peter, uh, what is your perception? You that you were there as a plenarist, and you had the original view of the beginning of the event with all these uh, people from different places, teachers and students this time. Uh, what what is your perception of this kind of event now in Aguascalientes? Uh, Piri, uh, I think it's uh, very exciting when uh, people that have a lot of experience. Uh, get together with the up-and-coming group. Uh, several times during the conference, in different sessions, I asked the people sitting next to me how old they were and what were they planning to do and so on. And they were saying things like 19, 20, 21 years old. Some of them wanted to be English teachers, but uh, at least a small group of them also, they were interested in becoming math teachers. And um, so uh, there was something for everybody there. And I just think it's uh, it's very exciting when uh, young people can uh, rub elbows with people with a lot of experience. And I think that's what happened at the UPTC. Yeah, I know for me, it was great to see some ex uh, students, now colleagues, and uh, seeing them again and having them share their experiences and um, certainly get a lot of uh, enjoyment out of seeing, seeing that. Um, I'm curious, uh, Salvador, if you could speak, because I know you had a lot of students there from the Universidad Panamericana that were actually part of the event, which I think is another level, another access or another way of looking at how successful something like this can be when you can get your own students involved in the process of uh, such an event. Can you speak a little bit about how you involved the students, what their reactions were, um, anything along those lines? Sure. I mean, uh, having an event this big requires a lot of work on the side of the, uh, the organizing committee, but the day of the, of the event itself requires 
far much more work. So we needed help from, from someone, right? So we invited students to participate as hostess, as hosts uh, in this event. Usually they do it with pleasure. They, they tend to be very participative and it's hard work. However, we had people from pedagogy that were listening to Peter, that were listening to other talks, and they were quite excited. They were really, really excited about how research is going on in their own university, which they really had no idea. So they were surprised of the talks. They were surprised of your talk, Benjamin. <laughs> Some people went into your talk and they were really pleased with the information they received. They didn't expect this. They just came to the conference to help, and once they listened to the conference, they were pleased and they were like very excited to be in the conference and they felt part of this team. When they saw that the UPTC was a very oh, kind of well-known conference, they felt proud and were happy of participating. If I could follow up, are the students all from the same major or are they from different majors? Can you talk a little bit about the type of student or what majors they are, are from? They were from different majors, but basically they were they were from ad advanced levels. Some of them were students from Carla, others were students from Peter, but they were different majors and different uh, levels. One of the most participative majors we have is uh, pedagogy. The pedagogy students are always eager to participate. They're always eager to experience new ideas and uh, business school, basically, right? Mm -hmm. We have, so we could say pedagogy and business school were the more participative students in, in the conference. Mm -hmm. uh, what I sense in here is that we, we have kind of different levels of bonding uh, because we started talking about different universities integrating to the event, but also now that you mentioned that students participating and, and being part of the event, uh, how is that working? in the bonding with your teachers in there? I think it works uh, pretty well because you develop more uh, confidence with them, uh, you know them better, and they feel part of the event. They feel that they are taking an important role during the event. In one of the previous shows we had with Benjamin, we were talking about connecting with the students and the importance of having a way to establish uh, a relationship to uh, um, to support all the academic objectives. And uh, I don't know, uh, maybe Carla also as a teacher from the university, can you tell us uh, how can you um, um, measure or, or determine this uh, connection with the students in pro of the academic objectives in the subjects they have. Okay, um, thank you for the question, first of all. Uh, I believe that the connection with the student is actually the most important thing because if there is no connection, and I think all, all teachers have experienced this, um, the students, especially university students, uh, who are basically, they want to please, they want to get along with you, but they will put up a wall and this wall will prevent any, basically any uh, language acquisition from entering if there is no connection. So we need to find a way as teachers to basically get to all of our students to try to connect with them. And there are so many personalities within one classroom. So it's actually one of the most difficult tasks that we can do as teachers, but it's something that I believe most of the teachers at this university, at the beginning of the semester, we focus one to two weeks in just getting to know our students so that we are able to establish that connection. Have you detected after the event, any other bonding and connection amongst students themselves after participating in the event? Uh, definitely. I think it's human nature to to help and to feel as though they can, they were part of something big and they saw the amount of people that were uh, walking around that attended the plenary, that went to the conferences and they were guiding them. So I think they felt more comfortable with us, definitely. Yeah, Peter, did you um, 
see how, how do you do you, do you uh, agree with that what was, what's been your experience with your students especially those who late, leading up to event uh, to this event they participate how does it work after the event and what kind of feedback do you get from your students from this experience well as i was just uh, uh, listening to the the comments by ruth and carla benjamin i my i had a flashback and I'm going back to about 1985, before some of the people at the table and the other screen were born. <laughs> and my flashback was that from New York University, where I did my undergraduate work, we went to Cornell for a four-day conference. It was on cognitive psychology. And I can tell you that one of the primary memories, the principal memories that I have of my undergraduate work was going there with a few other psychology students that were in the department. And I, I really hope when these kids are, these 19, 20, 20 year olds, the, the students, there were about 80 students amongst the group, you know, um, I hope that they can look back five, 10, 15 years ago when they are teachers and say, one of the things that I really took away from that semester was going to the Universidad Panamericana for that UPTC. I really hope that would happen, yeah. And there's no doubt, I think when uh, uh, there's a cut only uh, between the teachers, between the staff, but also from the staff to, there must have been, Ruth could, would tell us the exact number, but there were 14, 15, 16 students helping out, organizing everything. I mean, putting together the, the packets and putting together the, the bags with all the information so on. Uh, when there's a common goal, it binds people together, you know, and that's what we had. We wanted to give a really good conference and uh, show the best that we can offer uh, through the language department. And that's what we did, teachers and students alike. So um, I guess that those are the things that come to my mind right now. That's great. We've talked a lot in the past about performance tasks and really trying to find those those activities, those tests that really motivate and drive students to participate. And I think this is a really great example of that, where you can bring everybody together for one uh, total performance that, that really draws and brings everyone together. Um, I'm curious, um, Salvador, about the now looking back after this year's event, uh, the, how you evaluated. I know that you had uh, some surveys that you asked all of the attendees to fill out after each, each of the talks. And um, I'm, I'm curious if, if that was helpful without getting into the specifics of, of those uh, responses, but are you, do you feel that that was uh, enough information? How do you evaluate the, the uh, event afterwards? Um, and is it just based on those responses? If you could speak a little bit to, to that. Yes, as you mentioned, we had evaluations after the plenary speakers. We had evaluations after the talks. And I'm glad to say, not because it's a live show, but we had pretty good responses. In general, we had pretty good responses. Peter was one of the champions in our grades. He had a very high grade. I won't say the number, so he doesn't feel like uh, too sure. happy, like showing <laughs> off. But yeah, he was one of our champs. In general, yes, uh, I mean, we have to start like from very analytical numbers. So we consider the evaluations themselves as a number, as a grade. However, we, we had the chance to talk to teachers we know very well, and they're not afraid to say what they really think. And we had pretty good feedback as well. They were very, very pleased with the conference, with the topics, with the logistics of the event, with the staff that helped, with the students that were helping. They said they were friendly. So we consider both very numerical information, and we can all, we also had a few interviews with teachers that attended the the conference and gave us their point of view, and then we gather as a committee and we gave our point of view again our our evaluation the way we saw the event, and it turns out that like they said every head is a different world, and we each had a different point of the of the event, but we found it was. Uh, it came out as we planned it, let's say. Uh, from, from that evaluation, Salvador, uh, what, what do you think would be the main advice or, or some of the main advices you could give us in case we just, it just occurred to me that uh, tomorrow I'm going to held a, a Congress here at my house. <laughs> so from that evaluation, 
what would you think uh, would be a good advice for me to take? You know what, uh, Peter mentioned bonding on the side of the teacher, the students with teachers. And we found that this event created a bond among the staff, about the, uh, among the organizing committee, because you mentioned, what advice would you give me? First, a lot of planning, a lot of communication. We gather, we share ideas, and nobody had the last word. It was a matter of having the, main, the best idea for the event. So we took our time to get organized. Each one of us had a responsibility and each one of us covered that responsibility. So it made the group stronger. So I would say uh, preparation and communication. And, and I know for sure, Ben, you got something to say about this planning and communications in the sense that uh, we are getting into uh, productive outcomes that we can actually uh, feel from the task itself. Isn't this what we want from our students, our teachers' information, and actually our teachers in service, planning and communication? Yeah, I think one of the things I appreciate most really about your good advice, Salvador, is the, the way teachers and students work together, and, and not just the implementation, but the planning though, and, and the review at the end. So they're really involved from the beginning to the very end. Uh, it's not just you know one or two people doing the whole event. It's really bringing everyone together. And and I think for me that's the big takeaway. And uh, one thing that uh, I really congratulate you and your whole team and all of the the students that participated in and bringing that together. Uh, because you know for having such event here locally in Aguas Calientes, it's it's not that common, right? I mean you know we we have a lot of good conferences here throughout Mexico throughout the country, but it's really nice to have such, uh, such a good conference here locally that uh, English teachers, which there are many here locally, have an option to further or continue their professional development and to connect and to network and to make those relationships. Even though we have technology where you want, some may argue, because why do we even need to go to a face-to-face -face conference? We can just go online, right? But I think most of us here would agree that it's not the same as going face-to-face -face having that relationship, meeting that person, and learning uh, from each other, you know, from, uh, from the entire process. So uh, again, I want to thank you very much uh, for all of you for, for sharing your, your insights, really, and what it takes to, to bring and put together such an event. And I hope that it's uh, something that you continue in the future. Uh, I'd like to say, if I, if I may, uh, one thing that I learned from this last conference or, or the our UPTC was, and it was very nice to know and to learn from, uh, to learn about was the sharing experiences with teachers. It's not, teachers came not only for a conference, but also to share ideas, to share experiences with uh, their partners. And I was really, really happy to see that even, uh, you know, very experienced teachers were kind of interacting with the students in this case that we had uh, students as well as teachers. We had all, uh, a balanced number of each one of each side. And I was really happy to see teachers talking to students and vice versa. And it was one of the things we learned from this conference that, that uh, we always, we never stop learning. And it's very important, it's very interesting to share ideas, experiences, with students, those of us who have more than 10, 15, 20 years of experience, and we never start learning. I, I talked to a couple of students, and you know, I always learn something from, from, from these 20 year old kids. I say kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was it. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I'm, I totally agree with, with you in, in that sense, Mario, because uh, we always. In, and, and, and I think uh, that's a generational thing. We always have something to learn from each other. And we always have something from each generation to adopt and acquire. And I think uh, you had a nice uh, space. Uh, unfortunately, when I wanted to, to sign up for the event, there was no space. And it was early. It was early in the submission. And, and there was no space. I was really glad to hear that. But uh, I, I think... You, you, you had a nice forum to have um, students uh, and teachers share their 
feeling and 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 expose this need of being heard, which at the same time it's a need to 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 have a feedback of what I have to say and also to listen to you and give you my feedback about what you have to say. So I'm really glad we, we can have this kind of events. I, I thank you a lot for for joining us today and 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 uh, sharing this experience beyond the event. And if anyone wants uh, to, uh, oh, go yeah, ahead. Could I, could I chip in, Benjamin? That uh, in 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 the program uh, on the cover of the program, we had uh, a quote from Socrates that the unreflected life is not worth living, and we thought that it would be good to include that because at the end of the school year, sometimes it's a good time to pull together uh, uh, idiosyncratic events that happen between students and maybe meeting with parents and preparing exams and lesson plans. And it's a good time to reflect on what went well and how I could become uh, a better teacher for the upcoming year. And uh, so I think it's, a, it's an important role of the UPTC to push the pause button when we're always working, we're always teaching, many teachers have multiple positions and so on, to say, hey, let's get together for an afternoon and uh, pause and think and share. Um, the other thing that comes to mind as I was listening to what Mario said, um, and also Carl about making connections, is that, um, you know, right now, it seems that research suggests that about half the teachers in the world are reporting some level of burnout, that having two or three jobs and uh, nowhere is teaching really well paid anywhere in the world, right? Um, that uh, supposedly the research suggests when teachers get together with other teachers, it allows them to uh, decrease the burnout a little bit. It allows them to let off a little bit of steam and say, hey, I too sometimes have difficult days, difficult students, difficult stretches. And so when we reach out and make connections either between our staff, our language department and within universities, within departments from different universities, it might uh, lessen a little bit the burnout that we could be subject to. So I thought it was, uh, it's another plus of having a conference like the UPTC. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. <clears throat> Yeah, the awesome. issue of burnout, burnout is real. We, did, we just had a semester student do a research on burnout, and uh, you know, it's uh, really it is an issue. And I know for one, having attend an event like this does really recharge the batteries. It really kind of gets gets you back into into a field that that is enjoyable and uh, you know worthwhile. All right. Well, uh, thank you. I think um, if anyone is listening and wants to post a question to uh, Salvador, Mario, Ruth, Carla, uh, or Peter, feel free to leave a comment in uh, the Facebook page and uh, leave us feedback. If you want to be um, leave comments about uh, any other events that are coming up, if you want to share any uh, types of events similar to these that are coming up here locally in Agus Cayentes or abroad, feel free to share those as well. Okay, I think we'll move on uh, now to our second segment. And uh, Peter has was nice enough to share in his plenary at the UPTC 2018 uh, the his research on um, the music model. And um, I think Peter, could you kind of give us kind of a backdrop into maybe how the research emerged, the purpose of the research, and and what kind of problem that you were addressing. Uh, by doing such research? Uh, sure, of course I would. Um, this uh, uh, came up um, about a year ago. Uh, I was uh, searching the internet on wondering how we could motivate Generation Z. And uh, those of us are, that are, have, have read something about Generation Y and Z, we find that there, um, uh, there are certain characteristics that make them a real challenge to teach. For example, the number one thing, uh, and in the plenary, I asked people to work with the person next to them and to talk about two or three adjectives or words or phrases that they would use to describe Generation Z. And they came up with things like, they're so immersed in technology and they 
oftentimes seem more motivated by what their friends say rather than the authority figure, for example, in this case, the teacher. And um, also sometimes the attention span is more limited uh, today considering, for example, Google has analyzed that the, uh, the average time that somebody who's 15 to 20 years old spends on a website is about eight seconds before they switch to another page. And um, so uh, some teachers commented, they were commenting in pairs during the plenary, that um, this makes it a challenge because, uh, for example, if we prepare a 10 minute activity for students to do in our 50 minute class or 60 minute class, then um, imagine if they're accustomed to eight second uh, stimulation from one web page and we ask them to do one activity for 10 minutes. So eight uh, goes into 10 minutes about 60 times. So that would put uh, students to feel in a position of, wow, this is really drawn out, this activity. And they, you know, they're accustomed to moving on to the next thing right away, not going. This, this makes it very challenging to work with Generation Z because it almost seems like whatever we do, they, it's, it's not enough for them. They want to move on to the next thing or uh, they, they just want to finish and they want to get back into their own self-indulgent behavior. So about a year ago, thinking about the challenge of working with Gen Z, I went online and I came across um, uh, uh, a professor whose name is Dr. Brett Jones, and he is at the University of Virginia. Um, and he has been for the last nine years promoting something called the music model. So our department's response over the spring semester was um, to take some of his ideas from the music model and incorporate them into our, our department. And this worked its way into a research study where we had 268 students participate, half of whom received uh, uh, approximately uh, five strategies, teacher strategies, and half participated in a control group. And I just want to go over here and uh, throw up one screen. If I can, I'm going to come uh, share it with you. Here I'm going to go. Uh, I hope you can see that screen. I think I'm doing what I'm supposed to do to share that screen. This is uh, over here. This is Dr. Brett Jones, and he works at the University of Virginia. This is the state of Virginia on the east coast of the United States. And the music model involves five key principles that form the acronym MUSIC, M-U-S-I-C. And uh, his point is he's pulled together research from motivation to learn from uh, different researchers. And his first point is that if a student feels that they have some autonomy, that they have some control over the materials and how activities are carried out, they would report that they're empowered. If they believe that English is useful, that contributes to motivation. If they believe they can be successful, also it increases student motivation. And if they find activities interesting, and very importantly, as Carla referred to, is they people need to feel that those people around them, both their peers and their teachers, care about them. Um, this, these all work together to increase student motivation to learn. And his point is that when motivation increases, uh, there some important things come into play that are going to uh, uh, raise student learning and therefore performance. For example, if these five things are in play in the classroom, then a student reports they're motivated and therefore they will are more likely to use higher level learning strategies. So some of us who have gray hair and who are bald, uh, like myself, we will remember somebody named Rebecca Oxford who wrote uh, uh, language learning strategies way back in 1990. And she said that there are some very basic learning strategies such as memorization, rote learning, and there are very advanced uh, learning strategies that are, for example, being creative, developing a rubric on whether what I create in class is effective or not, and then actually evaluating what I've done. Um, and this is called self-regulated learning. So it's very clear in the research now, if a student is motivated, self-regulation, in other words, students taking responsibility for their own learning increases 
And it's also very clear in the literature that as um, self-responsibility, I am responsible for my English language proficiency as much as or more important than the teacher, then learning increases. And as learning increases, performance increases. So I just said a mouthful. I'm going to put this pause. I'm going to turn off my microphone. And before I talk about some of the results that we found out, I would just like anybody in the department uh, to contribute on anything that I, I just okay. said. Okay. I know this in my groups. Every time that we uh, gave them the opportunity to prepare, to participate, they were very excited because they prepare their presentation carefully and their peers, their classmates were very interested uh, listening to them and they were like explaining and sharing. In the other side, uh, also when we were uh, playing the music that they were required at the beginning of the semester, also they were fascinated, enjoying, ah, oh, this is my song, I brought it and I suggested that one. So I think it was really, really um, good for the students to participate. Uh, yes, Peter, I'm, I'm kind of sensing uh, for, for, from what you said about the, the five different elements, empowerment, the, the content to be useful, uh, if students can be successful in it, if they're interested and, and if they feel care, uh, I, I pretty much uh, think uh, it, it totally matches what you mentioned about the attention spam and these kind of characteristics of new generation. Like, um, uh, for example, now that we have these extended uh, teenage years, which bring uh, a lot of... Uh, 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 a lot of different situations into the classroom, which uh, which uh, have to be dealt from a, from a point of view of the individual, as these five aspects mentioned them. There need to be care. There need to be considered uh, part of uh, of a society of a of a community. Uh, there there need to be successful. There need to 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 actually be able to, I, I mean, all of these five aspects match in there. Uh, at some point, we were discussing in in one of the programs about the audience uh, caring about three main aspects, three main aspects in a class. What is it? Uh, why do I need to know that? And how do I do it? Which pretty much goes towards this. I would add to those three questions also. Uh, and taking into consideration the music model, uh, the 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 commitment that is increased by the feeling of of uh, which would be number five, they feel carried by others in the learning environment. So motivation raises. I think uh, uh, it's pretty clear picture in brief of 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 the elements. And 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 I would like to listen to some uh, practicalities of what's been going on in your classes. Yes, well, if you'll, uh, if you'll permit me, I don't mean to dominate the conversation, but I, I would like to give you, PD and the rest, um, five strategies that, um, you know, very importantly, in, uh, it was, I believe, on January 4th, we had our first teacher meeting, and we, there were 15 possible strategies that we could, uh, in through which we were going to convert the five principles of Dr. Jones into in-class observable practices. And what we did was we had the teachers work in pairs or trio that, that day, and each one, each trio took one of the five principles, and they decided which one, how we were going to turn that into an observable uh, teacher strategy in the classroom. So what I'm going to do is go back over here, if you permit me to this, and I'm going to throw up the next slide here. And uh, PD, I'm going to try to answer that um, uh, comment there, here, by putting on compartir, right? And I hope you can see that. And what this says is, these were the five strategies that came out of Dr. Jones here. The first one was empowerment, and we asked students to uh, 
teach grammar points to their peers instead of the teacher teaching the grammar points. For usefulness, we uh, showed some videos of people from uh, very large, important companies in Aguas Calientes. This time it was from Flextronics, which is an almost entirely English-speaking uh, transnational company, even though it's located here in northern Aguas Calientes. And this lady, Mabel, for example, said that if somebody speaks, uh, if somebody is a bilingual and they have uh, um, a bachelor's degree, let's say in engineering, they would earn three times what a monolingual Spanish speaker would earn. So by usefulness, we wanted to convince students that English is directly related to a higher position in a company and also a higher salary. Regarding success, our practical strategy was to identify two or three struggling students in each one of our classes that participated in the experimental group and, in, and talk to them one-on-one -on -one and try to encourage them uh, to continue working, to be persistent and to continue practicing. Because really there's only one uh, obstacle between not being able to speak English and being able to speak English well, and that is the decision to keep practicing. Okay, so Krashen said, just as we all know how to breathe, we all know how to walk, we all know how to eat, we can all learn a uh, second language, the language acquisition device never turns off. So our role in this one was that we would encourage them to continue practicing, not to desert. Uh, the fourth strategy had to do with interest. As um, Ruth just mentioned, we asked students to send us the lyrics of their favorite song. And at the beginning of each class, or maybe three or four times a week, we would ask uh, the students to, uh, we would ask them, they would direct their attention to the screen, and we would protect, project the lyrics of one of the students' songs and of course play it, and then they would jot down in their notebook these missing words. That's how we try to raise the interest because the songs played were generated by the students, not by the teacher. And finally, to show that we were caring, in that meeting on January 4th, the teachers proposed that we create a feedback form in, on which the students could write, and you can see down here what they liked and what they don't like about the course, and also at the bottom, there was an open-ended space for any comment that they wanted to make. So this is how we receive feedback and then we would get back to students on how we would try our best. Of course, the course is defined by materials and objectives, et cetera. It's not just totally up to the students, but we would try to include student comments to, to feed, to give some backwash on how our courses are going. So with that, again, I'm gonna turn off my uh, screen and go back and perhaps some of the teachers that tried some of these strategies could offer some uh, personal anecdotes. Um, okay, after trying these strategies, it was, um, I specifically liked the one about caring, about uh, motivating them because when students feel that their that their teacher is in fact motivating that the the teacher cares for them and wants them to prosper um they for that same reason are motivated to go to class uh as we know in the university it is difficult for them to actually even attend class so they're not only motivated uh, to attend class but they actually do the work because they want to please us because they know that we care for them and that we're there for them. So I think this is something that, um, this was a point that actually prospered in my specific classes, especially with my personality. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, uh, regarding the, the feedback form, how often you applied it and what was surprising about that that you didn't anticipate? Right? And, and how did you take that feedback? If you could talk a little bit about uh, Carla and anyone else who wants to add, uh, but I'm really curious about how that feedback form uh, was applied and, and your reaction or opinion. Okay, this feedback was given to the students every two weeks. 
during the semester. Every two weeks we were coming up with these formats and in an anonymous way they they uh, write down what they thought about the class. And were there moments when you received feedback that you changed or adapted your teaching or was everything just confirming what you had been planning and implementing? Okay, we had two groups, one experimental group and other group in, in which we were not giving these formats. So everything we, we were giving it into Peter, we were handing into Peter without making changes yet. Well, actually, I can say that uh, from my feedback, um, some of my feedback was uh, homework. They, they weren't too fond of the homework, so I thought, okay, let's bring the homework into the classroom and see if I have the same results as I did when it was actually done in the home. So I actually did change a couple of things uh, because of the feedback that I received. Uh, yeah, I can see in here from the examples you were mentioning uh, that we go back to Salvador's idea of planning and communication. What about the logistics for all of this? Well, once again, uh, we usually have a meeting at the beginning of the semester where we set out our objectives. So in this first meeting, uh, we talked to the teachers, to the whole staff, talking about this new project Peter had proposed. And in that same meeting, we like had, uh, Peter was very specific with dates, with specific tasks we had to do. So uh, we shared the information again. Uh, we, we shared a plan. We sh we, uh, Peter communicated the way it had to be implemented. And then Peter was the one in charge of giving this follow-up on the evaluation formats, on the tasks that had to be done. So, and well, we have a very tiny, tiny teacher's room and P mm -hmm. Peter managed to get everything in there and make teachers work perfectly. And you know what, the good advantage we have is that uh, our teachers are very eager to participate. They are very hardworking. And I think Peter, uh, Peter never got a, I forgot, or oh, sorry, I don't wanna do it. Uh, we usually work in a smooth way, but based again on planning and communicating, I think. Hey, uh, I want you to know that in past uh, events, I, I learned something from one of my colleagues, Mario. He's sitting there to the left of that table. And when he had to organize different events, for example, one was like a cultural communications fair where each group represents a country. What Mario would do is he would plaster the teacher's room that looked like a Christmas. Everywhere you turned, you would see another notice reminding us teachers what we had to do. So uh, Benjamin I and PD, I went into this knowing that every week I needed and actually taped to the center of the table. We have an oval table there in the center of the teacher's room where they all gather around between their classes and they sit and that's where we celebrate birthdays and we get together and we have a cup of coffee between classes. And right in the middle of that, I would, I would tape uh, what teachers were responsible for that week. And I have to say, Benjamin, it was really amazing how teachers uh, followed through on what we said at the beginning of the semester. It was really nice. So I think uh, some, maybe uh, what I learned from Mario is with a little reminder, everybody, if the staff is professional as it is at the UP in the, our language department, they are willing to do it. But if without that little reminder every week, it could be that we get overwhelmed with all sorts of details and we, we might forget, but that didn't happen during this course. So for the first eight weeks of the semester, we carried out uh, things very, very smoothly. Yeah, well, definitely it sounds like it's a, a commitment on everyone's part and uh, takes everyone to contribute. I, um, I, I'm curious now looking back at uh, this experience, and this is for you, Peter, and, and everyone else who, uh, was part of the study then what if you take each of those five elements is there one more than any other that either was more challenging or just you the the results were more surprising i'm i'm looking at this article from uh, jones where he he wrote i think this is back in 2009 uh, it's called motivating students to engage in learning so this was the article that he published i believe uh, that bringing forth this idea of the, of the model, the music model. But he says here that um, 
talking about implementing, he talks about five different components of you know what to consider when implementing these this model. And one of the points that he makes is that he says the first time a course is taught, instructors should consider the five components in the design, but only focus on a few components that they believe are most critical. So in your experience, was there one one of these elements that stood out most challenging, most surprising that for you as an institution thought, well, maybe we need to focus more on this first if you're, you're looking at it from a teacher that's just beginning uh, to become aware of, of this model. So uh, Benjamin uh, and Petey and everyone, I'd like to again, uh, to answer that question about which strategy might be more challenging and might be for young teachers to keep in mind. I'm going to share this screen here that comes up. Um, if you look here, this is um, these red numbers here, Benjamin, in answer to your question, this 4.7 right here and 4.6, these are the areas where, that were more challenging for the teachers in our department. Um, what happened was there was a pretest, an online questionnaire called the Music uh, Model Inventory, which measures student perception of these five in the classroom. And then seven, seven and a half weeks later, we went uh, ahead and measured if there was any difference before and after. And uh, just looking at this column before, teacher, uh, students that um, have been with us because they, th this is uh, the spring semester, they had already been with us at least one semester and it could have been two, three or four, this was their fourth semester with us. You can see that a challenge for our department, by the way, these numbers are on a Likert scale from one to six. So um, the fact that our caring was 5.5, I think this was a very high number and it shows that the students believe that the teachers in our department are very caring and they're very interested in helping students maximize their learning. They also believe from the very beginning that uh, English is useful. So a 5.2 out of six, again, it's like hitting a home run and students also believe they could be successful. Now, these two red numbers over here are going to answer the question that they seem to be a bigger challenge. So let me say a little bit about this, this one over here called empower. Empower means that a student believes they have some control over um, course activities, course materials, and even evaluation, uh, grouping, and how the class uh, operates. So the students reported um, significantly less. For example, this 4.7 is significantly less on a student t-test at 0.05 level um, and also this 4.6 is significantly less. So while we're hitting a home run on caring, students believe that they do not have uh, the same level of control that they would like to have in the classroom. Down here, interest means that they find the activities interesting. So this is our uh, our Achilles heel in our department. And um, so um, in answer to the question, this is what we found um, curiously looking at studies by Jones. Jones found that um, uh, also empowerment was uh, a low uh, point for students in other courses, in courses from Iceland to China, to the Middle East, to the United States. Students do not feel they are empowered in different classes. Now, Jones, to this, this is the first year um, that Jones is actually going to carry out a study including English as a foreign language student, uh, foreign language learners. There has been no study during the first nine years of the music model that looked into English as a foreign language. So this study actually was the first one. And I mentioned that because this point of interest is an Achilles heel, I think, for a language department because at the Universidad Panamericana, nobody comes to the UP to become an English teacher. We do have a pedagogy department. Um, it is not the largest department. We have many more business students and engineering students. In fact, 
Probably the UP is known for its engineering program. So when you talk about interest in an English class that is for some secondary compared to their engineering courses, to their gastronomy courses, uh, to their pedagogy courses um, and business courses, this becomes a real challenge. How do we stimulate interest in the language course? So where we're going with this is for the upcoming fall semester, um, when we the teachers meet uh, in late July, early August, we will again hand out a number of possible strategies, maybe four or five to stimulate empowerment and four or five to stimulate interest. And then teachers will work in groups of two or three and say, okay, to increase empowerment, to increase learner autonomy, they will do strategy A and C. And to increase interest, they'll do strategy D and G. Um, and then we will also do a before and after, and we'll see if we can raise these numbers, let's say, to over five. I don't know if I'm being clear in this presentation, so I'm going to turn off this screen and kick the ball back to you guys for ideas and or questions. Yeah, I'm curious if any of your teachers have anything else to add uh, related to this, uh, the interest or an empowerment elements of the music model based on, on the study? Um, uh, yes, thank you. We recently went to a conference. It was a conference for all the teachers here, not just English teachers, um, but all the, all the university teachers. And the theme of this conference was teaching uh, in the future. And they just explained how we need to change our teaching, how we need to change, because times are going to be changed. And I think that's part of empowerment. Um, in the past, it was basically the teacher is sitting in front of the students. The teacher is the, the center of attention. And that's something that we need to change. They need to, our students need to be the center of attention. And as English teachers, they have taught us this, they have been teaching us this for a long time, but it's also about empowering the students that they are contributing to their uh, learning. And that's something that I think not just English teachers, but all teachers need to do. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Carla. Um, yeah, and just thinking out loud, I'm curious um, if things like differentiated instruction from Wiggins and McTie's is anything, has anything to do or might have something to do with maybe providing more agency to the students where they take more of an active role in deciding on the content, the process, different products, even the learning environment, making decisions about how they can interact, if that might contribute to both these two elements of interest and empowerment, because I see those two very closely related. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious to, to learn how you what you guys do in the future as far as uh, addressing these two and uh, and yeah thanks again for sharing uh, I, I understand you have already some evidence of immediate results as Carla mentioned about the uh, motivation to attend class uh, I, I see a lot of organization in, in this kind of work and and, and the question where well, the question goes to the idea of the parallel advantages of working like that. Have you seen any advantage in teachers' community besides the project itself by working in this way? At the end of the semester, we got together and we had a barbecue. And there, it was like a celebration that we had accomplished something important that was beyond uh what's in our contract just to teach english that we had worked together and uh, done something important um i want you to know that uh two articles are being written um one of them is already done and we will try to publish that and in in that article although it won't have all the teachers names there would be an acknowledgement that we have contributed to the knowledge base related to the music model, specifically in the area of working with uh, English as a foreign language learners. Really interesting to see this, uh, this kind of work and, and for sure you will have more results and more things to go through in, 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 in this moment. I'm really glad to, to know uh, there's this kind of teams working around in town. Yeah, I guess, and uh, certainly look forward to, to reading that article and future articles uh, 
again, uh, I want to congratulate everyone and thank everyone for participating and sharing your, your thoughts and experiences and your research and um, uh, your teacher conference. You guys are really doing some wonderful things uh, there at the university. And uh, so hats off to, to everyone there for, for doing that and sharing. I would like to thank you for inviting us. I would like to thank you for, share, uh, for letting us share this, this information. And Petey, I promise you will be the first one registered for the UPTC 2019. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, but you're the first one registered. I, you have your very state for this now. <laughs> I'd just like to say, if I may, um, I think at the end, uh, motivation is what uh, the most important thing. Uh, if you're motivated, if, if our students are motivated, they learn. If they are not motivated, they just go to classes, right? I, I just finished my master's three years ago, a few years ago. And believe me, I've, in a few places I was not motivated and I totally forgot what they were talking about with teachers. But then I went to many other classes and I was very motivated going, and I really learned. So motivation, motivation, and if we do not try to motivate or, or generate motivation in our students, who else will do? So it, our classroom is a, a, a motivation generator, should be a gener motivation generator and that's what counts. I, I thank you also for inviting us to, to this interview, this conference, and um, it's really nice meeting you or seeing you guys again, Peter, Petey, Benjamin, and well, as well as my partners. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yes, I also want to thank everybody, uh, Mario, Salvador, Ruth, Carla, Peter, Benjamin. It's always a pleasure to have this kind of talks. I want to thank also my kid that allowed me to be in his room. I'm in a gamer's cave. You want to take a look? So, uh, thank you, everybody. It's a nice experience sharing with you. Feel free to join uh, to Teacher Learning Cast, to, to be with us uh, individually or as a group again, anytime you want. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone.